Hello and welcome to my weekly podcast and video, Stuff You Didn't Know About Acts. Or maybe you did know it, or maybe you don't agree with it. Today we are in Acts 14. So Paul and Barnabas, is they're in the middle of what's sometimes called the first missionary journey. It's not what Acts calls it. In fact, Paul's probably been on a lot of missionary journeys before now. Uh, we know that he spent three years in Arabia, probably between the years 33 and 36, now, he may not have been in Arabia that whole time, but he was up in the area, the region of Damascus, and probably preaching the good news because, of course, they try to arrest him. Um, he has to be let down the city wall of Damascus in a basket around 36. Then he goes back to Tarsus, uh, and he's there for about eight years. Knowing Paul, I mean, I can't see him sitting still in Tarsus for eight years. I'm guessing that he had evangelized all of Cilicia, probably went north to Cappadocia, maybe even north to Pontus, which would explain why he doesn't repeat that area uh, in the book of Acts at this point. And so, as you know from last chapter, Acts 13, the Holy Spirit sets Paul and Barnabas and John Mark apart. They lay hands on them and send them out to Cyprus. Now, this is, of course, the Lord's initiative, but it's not crazy uh, it might have. I'm sure it looked crazy to them at the time. I mean, hindsight is 2020. Uh, there are a lot of things that are like uh, seem obvious to me and seem crazy to other people. That doesn't mean I'm right because probably it's the other way around. Things that the Lord is in seem crazy to me, and other people uh, think it's obvious. But um, it's not crazy. It's not irrational for them to go to Cyprus because it's low hanging fruit. It's where Barnabas is from. They have relatives there. It's not that far. It's close by. Doesn't take as much money to go to as to go to say Rome, and so it makes sense. And of course, it's on the island of Cyprus that it really clicks in Paul's mind that God is calling him to be apostle to the Gentiles. I'm not sure that John Mark was too keen on this. Why is Paul taking over here? I thought my cousin Barnabas was in charge of this trip, and Paul keeps talking to Gentiles. Why is he talking to Gentiles? And I don't want to carry your luggage over those mountains in Turkey. Do you know how big those mountains are? I'm going home. Uh, we don't know the, the whole details. The book of Acts only gives us the impression that Mark was a quitter. I do think that there, probably, there was probably a whole lot more to him going home uh, than, than just uh, that he, he was a quitter. But as we saw in Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas, they go north. They go up to the city of Antioch of Pisidia, which is a different Antioch. It's in the middle of, of Turkey. Um, and um, it's here where the book of Acts really solidifies a turn to the Gentiles. It's not that they don't try. And, and the strategy of Paul, I mean, the strategy is, is, is a, again, it makes perfect sense. They first emphasize the synagogues. They go to their own people first. They have an in with, with the synagogues. They go to the synagogues. They preach the good news to the synagogue. Eventually, they get kicked out of the synagogue almost every time. And then they either, if it's really bad, they leave the city. Sometimes, like at uh, uh, Iconium and also later at Corinth, you know, they can stay on in the city. They kind of set up a parallel synagogue. I mean, what is a house church? I mean, we tend to think Jew, Christian, completely different things. Paul's a Jew. Uh, and so these house churches are really house synagogues. They are little uh, Jewish synagogues of what Paul thought was true Judaism. And so, you know, these are not, uh, now they, they turn from Judaism to Christianity. Now, that, that wouldn't be accurate. What they turn from is from non-believing Judaism to believing Judaism. Um, and they set up their own little synagogues, their own little house synagogues, um, where they worship um, uh, the Jewish way, but with the belief that Jesus is the Messiah having come. Now, of course, um, Paul has always been in the marketplace. I mean, from day one, these missions are parallel, right? Paul, from day one in a city, sets up his tent-making um, booth, at the marketplace, and he's witnessing to Gentiles from day one, no doubt. It's just that the focus, uh, as we see in the book of Acts, was on uh, the Jewish uh, community first. And, and when they're rejected, then it becomes um, uh, ex almost exclusive focus on winning Gentiles to Christ. And of course, um, the Jews that had believed continue with them in their own little house churches. So that's the strategy that we see in the book of Acts. Makes perfect sense. Again, the book of Acts highlights that the opposition to Paul is from Jews. Um, it says in verse 2, they, the Jews had poisoned the minds of the Gentiles in the city. But it's clear that, that it's both and, right? The Gentiles of the city also give opposition to Paul and Iconium, and eventually he has to leave, to leave town. Um, I, I've, I've argued before, I didn't come up with this, 
that Acts has a Christians aren't troublemakers emphasis. You remember that when, when Rome burned and people were blaming Nero, oh, Nero did this so that he could build a palace, you know, he set the fire, which is probably not true, but people blamed him. And so he thought, yeah, who can I blame? What's believable here? Ah, oh, I'm going to blame Christians. Everybody thinks they're evil. You know, I'll say they set the fire. And so Christians had the reputation of causing trouble. You remember that in the year, uh, actually, we haven't gotten there yet in history, uh, but in the year 49, we'll, we'll find uh, that J Jewish Christians are expelled from the city of Rome because of the controversy going on in the synagogues over Jesus. The book of Acts wants to emphasize, and I think Luke wants to emphasize to Theophilus, that when Christians are being Christians, they are unified and they are peace-loving. Um, and that really, that the trouble doesn't come from the Christians themselves. The trouble, trouble comes from those outside the church and especially non-believing Jews. Of course, there have been Christians throughout the centuries, quote-unquote Christians throughout the centuries, who have used this kind of language in the New Testament as, as an excuse for anti-Semitism. You know, we, can, we, we often do this. We, we rationalize is the word that Freud uh, used because we can't, we're not comfortable with, with admitting to ourselves that we hate people or that we're racist or sexist or oh, I'm not a racist, but blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we can't handle, I can't handle the pressure of being thought evil. And so we come up with some, oh, some righteous excuse uh, for our, our, uh, our, our hatred. We've seen this in America. I mean, how many pastors uh, in the early 20th century were part of the KKK? Um, you know, so pastor by day and go lynch people. You know, uh, not that it's not funny at all, you know, but, but, but we often hide evil hearts behind pious uh, outside uh, veneers. And so there have been people throughout the, the centuries um, who have used passages like this, passages in the, in the, in, you know, in the, the Gospel of John, you know, let his blood be on us and on our children. I think that's Matthew. Um, people have used those kinds of things as excuses for hatred, uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic um, kinds of, of uh, hatred. Uh, but that, of course, is not uh, valid Christian. <laughs> right out. No. Um, but but it is true that Acts highlights that, that Paul and the Christians were not the cause of the trouble. But the cause of the trouble were those that resisted, uh, resist, resisted them. But it's also clear that there was uh, Gentile opposition, um, especially at Iconium, you know, for example. And they get run out of the city. They go to Lystra which is to the south. By the way, uh, in 2013, uh, Keith Drury, Dave Ward, and Ro Ross Hoffman and I were privileged to travel around Turkey. We went to uh, um, what is, uh, it's not I Iconium, it's not called Iconium anymore, but the ruins of Iconium are buried under uh, an existing city. It's the city where whirling dervishes uh, came from. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. It's a Muslim thing, but it's also a spinny thing. Um, but anyway, that's not important right now. Um, Lystra is a mound. It's an un- unearthed mound. Uh, we uh, had, there's a lovely farmer that lives across the street. We had tea with him. Um, uh, so you can go see him if you go to, to the middle of Turkey, to Lystra, to the mound. Uh, lots of, uh, we call them uh, stickers that get in your shoe. I think some shoes had to be thrown away maybe uh, after, uh, or maybe that was Derby where the, the, they were just oppressive. But anyway, uh, that none of that is important. Uh, but he, he, Paul heals a lame man there. Notice that Paul heals a lame man in Acts 14, just like Peter healed a lame man in Acts 3, just like Jesus healed a lame man in the, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke is telling us something, I think, and that is that the power of the Holy Spirit, the things that Jesus did by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, he, the Spirit descends on him in the baptism. Uh, I mean, I think he had the Spirit before then, but the book of Luke does talk about the Spirit descending on him at, at the baptism. With, by the power of the Holy Spirit, things that Jesus did are things that Peter was able to do, are things that Paul was able to do, are things that by the power of the Holy Spirit are still possible today. Mind you, I have never, by the power of the Holy Spirit, healed a lame man, but I believe it happens. Uh, I've not seen it happen, but I believe it, it does It does happen. I think it's important uh, for the theology that the New Testament teaches that we believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. Um, so um, I think this is one of the... Um, not so subtle messages, stuff you don't know about Acts that Acts is implying that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do uh, signs and wonders just like Jesus did. Um, story of uh, 
Paul healing a lame man in Acts 14, the people are like, oh, these aren't men. These are, these are gods. Um, uh, Barnabas is Zeus and Paul is Hermes because he does all the talking. This used to be kind of surprising to me. I always thought, well, why isn't Paul Zeus the king of the gods? But um, again, just to get things in perspective, it's hindsight that we realize how important Paul was. At the time, Paul was not, the, oh, Paul, his, Paul's coming to town. Oh, you'll want to come and hear him. Paul was a controversial figure in the early church and probably not very favored by, I don't think headquarters liked Paul that much, or at least didn't privilege him. And I'm not sure how much he was loved at the, at the city of, of Antioch. Uh, next week, when we get to Acts 15, I'm going to put it alongside Galatians 2 and suggest that I think that Paul largely loses the argument at Antioch in Galatians 2. Um, Paul is uh, is not the center of Christianity at all uh, in their minds. We know he is. We know he goes on to write 13 books in the New Testament. You know, so we know how important Paul is. Uh, we know how central his theology is. He, he's 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 the and the number one writer who made it into the New Testament is Paul. We know how important Paul is. But Paul wasn't. He's number one. No, Paul's number two. Uh, uh, Barnabas is the one who they entrusted with the leadership of this mission. Barnabas is the Zeus, um, uh, as as the Book of Acts clearly indicates. By the way, there's a backstory here. If you if you know Roman literature, uh, there's a collection of, of mythology known as Ovid's Metamorphoses. And in that story, there's a story of Baucus and Philemon. And guess what happens in the story of Baucus and Philemon? Zeus and Hermes come down to earth and they walk among men. There are angels unawares among us. Um, uh, Zeus and Hermes come down. They come down to a region called of Phrygia which overlaps with Galatia. I'm not sure whether extended, it extended all the way to uh, Lystra, where this miracle takes place. It might have been a little bit to the northwest of, of Lystra, but it's, it's a similar region. Um, and in that story, Zeus and Hermes come down, and everybody's rude to them. Nobody is friendly to them, um, except for this one couple, Philemon and Balchus, who welcome them into their home and... Um, uh, they treat them nice. They feed them. They don't know they're gods. They're just being nice to people. Um, and I think, uh, and I'm going to say this in a second, we underestimate how important a virtue hospitality was in the ancient world. I'm not a, I, you know, I try to be nice to people, but hospitality, I don't invite people over. My wife invites people over. I'm an, I'm an introvert, you know, uh, I'll go out to eat with you, but I hate, you know, I, I don't really enjoy going into people's homes and I don't really enjoy, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm glad to do it. It's it's an important thing to do, you know. But but that kind of entertainment, hospitality thing, it's not it does not compute. Does not compute. That's not my my personality. I I do it because I believe I should I should do it. But hospitality was a major virtue in the ancient ancient world because the ancient world was a dangerous place. Um, we we know um, that when when Abraham runs out and welcomes um, the. Uh, the angels. It's not because he thinks he knows they're angels. It's because he's a virtuous man who is concerned for the safety of, of strangers in the land. Uh, probably the most uh, emphatic story along these lines is near the end of Judges, where this priest and his concubine, they say, oh, should I go to the city of the Jebusites or should I go to my own people in Benjamin? Um, probably best go to my own people in Benjamin. And then the people want to rape him. And when they can't rape him, they rape his concubine to death. This story at the end of Judges. And of course, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It, this is a central feature of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of, because of the glasses we have on today, we immediately fixate on the, the homosexual sex part of, of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus says that if a city, when he's talking about the mission uh, in the Gospels, he says, if a city doesn't accept you, wipe the dust off your feet, and it'll be worse for that city than it was for, for Sodom and Gomorrah. What is Jesus thinking? He's thinking a city that rejects God's messengers, just like Sodom rejected God's messengers. Um, so hospitality, is, and I used to laugh at this, ha, 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 but that was because of my own cultural in ignorance. I could not see my own glasses. Uh, I didn't realize my own assumptions were different from ancient assumptions. Hospitality was very important in the ancient world. 
And so when Zeus, Zeus and Hermes reveal themselves to Balkis and Philemon, they are furious at the people of the region who were rejected them and were inhospitable to them and were rude to them. And they destroy the whole area. They flood the whole area. Everybody but Balkis and Philemon dies uh, because they were not welcoming to Zeus and Hermes. So you can see what's going on in the minds of the people at Lystra. Oh, we're not going to let this happen again. We're going to make sure Zeus and Hermes get treated right this time. Um, and of course, Paul's like, he's horrified. No, I am not. I am not Hermes. Do I talk that much? Uh, you know, Paul, like, no, 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 please don't. He's horrified. Um, it, quite the opposite, by the way, of Herod Agrippa I, who when people say Herod Agrippa is a god, he's like, yes, I am. You know, Paul, Paul's like, no, I am not a god, which is the proper reaction, by the way. If anybody thinks, Ken, are you a god? The initial, initial response should be, no, not at all. Please, please don't, don't think that, by the way. Nobody has ever thought that. But anyway, that's not important right now. Paul talks a little bit about, in his talk to them, about natural revelation or what uh, John Calvin called common grace. You know, God is so nice to you. He gives you rain. He gives you crops. He gives you food. Um, Acts 17, when we get there, Paul will talk about how these things are pointers to God. And I do believe in natural revelation, that, that the heavens declare the glory of God. There are some... Uh, Christians who, who kind of break out in a hive when you suggest anything like that. I'm not one of them. Um, I believe that God has shown uh, himself to us in the creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The invisible things of God are clearly seen, even his eternity and uh, God, godhood power. So, um, little tucked uh, uh, comment of natural revelation in verse 17. Paul gets a taste of Stephen little irony here that the one who had supported the stoning of Stephen now gets stoned. And Paul is stoned uh, in verse 19. You know, it's kind of, oh, you fickle crowd. I mean, <laughs> crowds are fickle. The masters are fickle. One day they think he's a god, and, and the next minute they're stoning him to death, and they drag him outside the city. I, I don't know whether uh, Luke intended a little bit of comedy here, but it always, <laughs> I always kind of chuckle to myself when I read the story. It's kind of like the, 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 the other believers are standing around Paul saying, he's dead, he's dead. And then he gets up and kind of walks into town. I, oh, I, I guess, guess he's not dead. <laughs> I don't know, something about the way it's worded comes off as a little funny uh, to me. Um, at the end of the chapter, uh, Paul says something um, uh, through many hardships, we enter the kingdom of God. I don't know, this this um, this line comes to me often. You know, I've had a pretty nice life, pretty easy life. You know, occasionally there are things that seem hard to me. I know they're nothing compared to others at all, nothing. But, you know, this verse comes to mind. You know, God didn't pr promise that our time in this world would be easy, that uh, being faithful to Christ can involve going through hardships. And that certainly was the case for Paul. You know, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we believed in Christ, man, we are the most miserable people in the world. Um, and he kind of mocks the Corinthians too. You guys are already in the kingdom of God. I'm getting stoned over here. It's really nice for you to be ruling already. Um, but anyway, through many hardships, we enter the kingdom of God. So, then this ends the second, the first missionary journey, I'm sorry. First missionary journey ends. So the first missionary journey of Acts is in chapters 13 and 14. They go to Cyprus. They go to the middle of uh, Galatia. They come back to Antioch and it's over. And Paul shares uh, the good news. And this is, we're getting close to the end of the dreamy phase of the church of Antioch. Um, but good things, uh, Acts 15 highlights good things. Um, Acts 15 puts a positive spin uh, on the events that happen. Next, we'll find out about the Jerusalem Council when we come back next week on Stuff You Didn't Know About Acts.